<clears throat> well, <clears throat> had spring break, sun is shining. <clears throat> I'm cycling home now and it's not completely dark. Um, so uh, so things, things are looking up for me. I hope they are uh, looking up for you as well. Uh, we're continuing on uh, with uh, first order equations. We started looking at uh, quasi-linear equations last time. We'll continue with that. Uh, talk about um, conservation laws and, uh, and um, uh, uh, discontinuities that can come in this solution, which we'll call a shock waves. Um, and um, okay, well, let's make a start. Let me uh, press the right button here. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, so we were talking about uh, Berger's equation. So this is uh, an equation for u of x and t. Uh, it's going to satisfy uh, a first order equation. I'm going to write it in conservation form, which we'll come back to later on uh, in the lecture. Uh, which, if the solution is smooth, Uh, and by smooth, I mean uh, continuous and as many continuous derivatives as you need to make sense of the operation I'm gonna do, then you can ex expand uh, out uh, that uh, derivative to u ux is equal to zero, right? And we were gonna look at the Cauchy problem for this. That is looking at the solution for uh, all x uh, with initial conditions uh, u zero of x given. Okay, so got a. This is a, a well-defined problem. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, last time, oh here, hang on a second. Let me give our, us a little bit more space. Last time, what we looked at uh, were uh, continuing on from the last two lectures. We looked at the solution on characteristics. Right, and I looked at u of t on those characteristics. And I looked at the derivative of u. So, so far this curve is just some curve, right? X is a function of t, I'm just looking at the solution on the thing, I'm doing the chain rule, I'm getting uh, dx dt, uh, the partial of u with respect to x plus du dt. This is true for uh, any curve. Uh, but then we uh, pattern matched and went, if we uh, look here, right, if we look up here, uh, we see uh, that if we happen to take the derivative, right, the speed of this characteristic curve, if we happen to take it equal to the solution at that point, <clears throat> then a bunch of stuff falls out. So we're gonna take uh, dx by dt uh, is equal to uh, u of t. That would make this an ODE system to solve, right? if we knew the solution, okay? But if you took this and you put it in there and you used the, the PDE, then you would see that du by dt is zero. That's by the PDE. Right, so u is constant. on characteristic curves, which are curves which have slope equal to u, right? So uh, now remember what we had to kind of keep things straight is we're gonna give, I mean, x is x, like wherever it is, you know, out here, right? 
but we're gonna keep uh, the uh, X value at uh, time zero. We're gonna give it a new name, uh, S. And so I'm gonna have a characteristic curve that comes out uh, from the initial conditions. On that initial curve, U is constant, or on that characteristic curve, U is constant, which means that the curve isn't a curve, it's a straight line with constant slope. Uh, and so I get X of T is U zero of S T plus S and U on that curve, is just equal to the initial conditions. Okay, and then last time, <clears throat> uh, we identified uh, when a discontinuity will form. And I'll take you through, not the algebra of that, but the picture in a little bit more detail uh, this time. Uh, the initial uh, conditions I gave were uh, Gaussian hump. We looked at some of the algebra associated with this, uh, this hump. Uh, but the important point is that a, a shock wave will form. Okay, okay, let's look at this, right? If I'm looking at S equals zero, I'm going to say this has value one, like it's a Gaussian, right? I'm gonna have uh, something going out like this uh, and you will be identically one on that line, right? Because it started off with value one. And then if I take this slope, uh, this line with slope one, U is constant on that line. So it stays value of one, right? And then if I start over here, I'm gonna have a uh, slope slightly less than one until uh, they're going to zero and far out here, they're basically vertical lines, not quite, but almost, right? And then over here, I've got things moving with speed less than one. So slope less than one, I guess it's an inverse slope as, as I'm uh, drawing it on this XT plane, right? So over here, I've got these things, and so now you can see at some point uh, a discontinuity will have to form. Sorry, do you mind quickly explaining how you can inspect and see that the, the slope is decreasing on the right hand side? I just don't see it. Maybe I'm a bit slow. Oh, well, remember the slope is equal to the value of u0 of s. Oh, yeah, okay. Right? That makes sense. So it's <laughs> going to zero out here, it's going to zero out here. So they're going to be basically almost vertical lines out, out uh, for large values of uh, absolute values of x. Uh, uh, they're always positive, so you're always moving to the right. Uh, but you're moving really slowly and then you hit a maximum speed and then you're moving really slowly again out, out here. Does that, does that help? Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Okay, good. Is it a property of the Gaussian that you won't just get like a discontinuity really close to the origin? Because I can imagine if you're, if your U naught of S decreases too quickly, you're going to get like your characteristics crossing right away, right? Um, yes, although last uh, lecture we, we did the algebra to work out uh, where the uh, shock formed. Uh, it wasn't right at the origin. Like you, like you say, you could imagine uh, that, that, that that could be like where, where it's happening, but, but it isn't in this particular case. Right. So, so specifically for the Gaussian, there's some like kind of critical value where uh, if, because if, because if, it's kind of smooth near the near yeah. zero, so right. There was a, re a recipe uh, last time uh, for oh. uh, for how to find the the time of shock formation uh, and and its okay. duration. Thanks. Um, it's where the uh, the um, the inverse map of this implicit form of the solution. So where the inverse map uh, fails to uh, uh, to exist. 
Okay, so um, a shock is going to form in this case, uh, and there's some pictures in the uh, in the uh, posted notes with a little bit more detail of of uh, what's going on with the values of u. I'll let you look at that. Um, but now you can sort of think that with the theory we have, we can talk about the solution up to this point in this blue area, but we don't know how to define the solution after that. Now, we've had this idea of weak solutions before, right? Uh, where, you know, uh, things were discontinuous, but we could still make sense of them as solutions. Um, in this case, we need a, a little bit of extra information. Uh, and that's this conservation form. So this is what's known as conservation form. And I'll, I'll explain what that means. So um, remember Berger's equation is, it's like a cartoon of, uh, of the equations for gas dynamics. Uh, and uh, the equations for gas dynamics are, uh, well, there's some you know, physical relationships you have to have to put in. Uh, but uh, the, the basic uh, idea is there the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, right? Things that you think uh, should, uh, should be conserved. Uh, and when we introduce a, a shock uh, solution here, uh, we want to make sure we put it in uh, so that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, analog of those things in this simple form uh, is also conserved. Uh, the next model we're gonna look at, at as an example is gonna be a traffic flow model. Uh, and so um, we're going to uh, introduce a shock wave into this, those solutions, um, which will conserve the number of cars that are on the road, which you know kind of makes, kind of makes sense, right? You don't want to have a solution where cars are uh, being teleported in, uh, in or, or out uh, uh, of your road. So that's the idea. So this thing, this thing here, uh, this thing we can interpret as a flux. Of the quantity u, right? And I can uh, tell you that. Right, and so it, it's a flux of the quantity u. Um, it, it's positive to the right. Uh, negative to the left. Uh, and so if I look at the amount, this is the amount of uh, u uh, in uh, an interval, right? So I'm gonna pick an arbitrary interval x1 to x2. And I can just look at, hey, how much uh, stuff have I got? Oop, oop. Oop, hang on, don't write that down, don't write that down. Right, so if u was a density, then that would be the total mass of stuff in this interval. Uh, if u was momentum, then that's the total momentum in the interval. And if u was energy, then uh, this would be the total amount of energy in, in, in the interval. And if I look at dm by dt, so now I'm going, Gee, how is the mass changing in, 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 uh, in this region, right? Well, I'll just get the partial derivative 
And now I'm going to go back to the conservation form, which unfortunately is just a little bit uh, off screen here, where the time derivative is minus uh, the x derivative of f of u. Well, that's a derivative, which I can just integrate. And I'm going to get, now I have to be a little bit careful of the signs. I'm going to get a minus a f of u at x2 and t, and then plus f of u at x1 of t. Right, and so here is where you can uh, interpret uh, this f as a flux because I'm looking at the total rate of change of, let's say, mass in the interval, right? Uh, and how is the total rate of change of uh, mass changing in this interval? Well, there'll be a flux of stuff coming in one end. That's this one. But then I'll have to subtract the uh, flux that's going up the other end. That's this one, right? So. This is how you can call this form of the equations, the conservation form with F of U being a, a flux, okay? Uh, and of course, for gas dynamics, it's a, it's a vector system with three, uh, three uh, unknowns, density, uh, momentum, and uh, energy density. Um, typically, uh, you use density, velocity, then then density times velocity is momentum, and then energy density is, is a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, and you can write fluxes for those, and that's how you derive those equations in uh, this conservation form. Okay, so how is that related to um, this uh, idea of um, uh, 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 shocks and how we can uh, make progress understanding uh, how we can make a weak solution when they form. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to draw myself a little picture, right? And I'm going to have my interval x1 to x2. Uh, and I'm going to look in sort of a little time window here, right? right? I'm going to look in that time window. And I'm going to suppose that there is a, a shock in the solution uh, in that time window, okay? So I'm gonna have uh, X of T, this, there's, it's gonna be uh, a shock. Oh, oh, that's a German, German shock, sorry. It's gonna be a shock curve, gonna be moving with some speed, not a characteristic, right? Um, but uh, it's, it's sort of related, right? Uh, and I'm going to have a discontinuous solution uh, across uh, the curve. Okay, but I'm going to assume uh, that the solution uh, is smooth. Uh, to the right and left. So it's an isolated shock. Um, uh, kind of like you sort of expect to see uh, from the picture we had uh, of, of this uh, Gaussian hump and how it would behave with the Burgers equation. Okay. So now I'm going to look at the uh, mass uh, in uh, the uh, interval x1 to x2. And I want to take the time derivative of that, but because there's a discontinuity, I'd better divide this up into Right, I'm going to have the uh, shock uh, speed. Right, 
I'll have uh, this one. And then I'll go from the shock to the end. We've done this before, right? When we had to worry about uh, things being discontinuous, when we wanted to take derivatives of intervals, we just broke up the interval into the two pieces where it was continuous. Right, so now I'm gonna take the time derivative. Right, and uh, because uh, unfortunately we're, okay, so many reasons it's unfortunate, right? Uh, that we're not in a regular classroom with like the four boards that I can, I can spread this out on, okay, right? So um, we, can't, uh, we can't go back, right? Uh, but this is something which should still be true in our case. Right? Okay, there's a shock wave there, but right, uh, if we kind of isolated ourselves away from the shock, right, then the mass <clears throat> change in mass in that interval should still be like the, the flux going in minus the flux going out. So whatever's happening at the shock uh, uh, has to retain this property. Okay, so here, here is the red star which hopefully you have in your head. Uh, and I'll go back to, like I say, ideally it would be on the board right over there, right? As I was writing on the board over, over here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at this. Well, so I'm gonna have a piece that's gonna look pretty much the same as before. I'm gonna have the UT uh, part, which I'm going to uh, use the, um, I'm gonna use the uh, PDE to uh, change into minus F of U uh, X derivative, right? And I'll proceed like I did before. Uh, but now I've got another term, which is uh, DX by DT uh, times U. Now I have to be a little bit careful. It's U at the shock, but remember there's two, there's two sides. Right, so I have to talk about, this is u at x of t, but on the left-hand side. Right, oh, dx by dt, this is the shock speed. I'll call it uh, s. Right, and then I've got another term, Right, on the other side, which looks like uh, kind of what I was interested in, x1 to x of t, I've got the ut uh, dx, and then I've got, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I got that wrong, got that wrong, hang on, hang on. Now I'm going from the shock to the end, right, and then I'm gonna have uh, dx, by dt with a minus sign. Right, and the u that I'm gonna get here is at the uh, shock, but on the right-hand side. Right, and again, this is the uh, shock speed s. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, do these guys. So this is going to be the integral from x1 to uh, x of t. Now I'm gonna have a minus uh, f of u uh, x dx. I've still got the uh, s uh, u plus, oh, sorry, minus. Uh, and then I'm going to have the uh, minus the integral from x of t to x2, f of u uh, dx, and then I'll have minus the shock speed times the value uh, just to the right of the shock. Right, and now I can integrate uh, this, right? The fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm gonna get, um, f of u 
uh, x1 and t, right? And this is something which I'm expecting, right? If you go back to the red star, uh, I should be getting uh, a contribution to the change in mass from a flux coming in on the right-hand side. So that's the term which, which I'm expecting and I should get, right? Oh yeah, there's a derivative, derivative, not a subscript, but it's a, it's a derivative. Okay, now I get another term though, which is going to be minus F of U uh, at X of T minus, right? That's the uh, term coming from the, from the top. I've got the S U minus term, that's just that one. Now I'm gonna do the same game with this term. I'm going to get a minus F of U at X to uh, T, right? That's a term I'm, I'm expecting, right? Uh, let, me, let me make sure that we understand why we're expecting it. This is the star term, right? Our change in mass should have uh, terms uh, that involve flux in from the right and the left, right? And then I'm gonna have a plus F of U uh, X T plus T. One more bracket. And then I've got this guy minus S U plus. Well, I've got my, my mass in this interval, right? I've got flux coming in, I got plus going out, right? That's described by this thing, right? Now I look at this and I go, this should be zero, right? If all of these four terms don't add up to zero, that means I'm teleporting mass in or out of this interval, right? Which doesn't make sense. So conservation implies these four terms must sum to zero. Okay, and that's gonna tell me, what have I got? I've got a S. times u minus minus u plus plus f of u plus minus f of u minus. I'm just using some shorthand notation for, for, uh, for that. This has to add up to zero. Um, and you notice that both of these terms involve differences uh, in quantities across the, uh, the shock. The, the, the solution's discontinuous. So the values of F are discontinuous as well, right? Uh, and so there's some notation, uh, which is if I uh, put these square brackets uh, in words, this is called the jump in U. So it's the discontinuous change in U as you cross over the, the, the shock curve. So this is U plus minus U minus. And so similarly, I can talk about the jump in F, right? That's F at U plus minus F at U minus. Right, and if I put those two things together, I get the shock wave. I take this over to the other side. I change the sign. And I get that this is the jump in F divided by the jump in U. Okay, and this is called the Rankine Hugonio condition. Typically written RH because who wants to write out Rankine Hugonio? 
who remembers how to spell Hugonio? I don't, I, I might not get it right here. Okay, but if, if I just say RH, then, uh, then, I'm, then I'm good, okay? Well, let's consider Berger's equ equation. Right here, F is one half of U squared. Right, so the shock wave or the shock speed is one half a u plus squared minus u minus squared divided by u plus minus u minus. And uh, a little bit of uh, high school algebra gives you that this is one half of u plus uh, plus u minus. So it's the average average of the characteristic speeds. So if a shock forms, um, okay, now you know uh, what a speed uh, it's gonna move at uh, based on uh, the solution values on either side. Oh, there's a question. Uh, the shock curve is not a characteristic. Uh, that's right, right? Uh, characteristics are where the solution is smooth, everything is going uh, good. Uh, but then when these things come together, right? right? When they come together, then something, a discontinuity goes out. In the case of Berger's equation, it's the average of the two speeds on either side that the, that the discontinuity moves out. Okay, so. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, can, can you say, so can you say that the shock curve is like the curve formed by all of those points where we saw the discontinuities crossed each other or, or is that not at all the way to think about it? Well, okay, so uh, different problems, different things can happen, okay? In that particular uh, problem, uh, there will only ever be one shock. So there'll only ever be one discontinuity. It'll be one curve that moves. Uh, and you can sort of see in your head if you think about it, but you have to think maybe long enough, right? Uh, that um, the uh, shock curve will tend to uh, a zero speed as time goes to infinity. It'll be those almost vertical lines that are kind of merging right at the end. Uh, and so, um, you can actually get, I was gonna say an analytic formula for the solution to the uh, shock curve in that case, except it might not be an analytic formula. You can get a, a, an ODE that you can solve to figure out what the, what, the, what the shock curve looks like in that case. I've asked students to do that before, but I can't remember if it's something where you can make analytic progress or if you need numerical methods. Um, and for Math 400, I can't uh, assume that you know uh, yeah, how, to, how to do numerical stuff, even though you probably can. You know, MATLAB ODE 4.5 is, is what, you would, what you would call. Okay, uh, but now I've so talked a long time and now I can't remember whether I've actually answered your question. So, so follow up uh, as needed. Yeah, I guess, so the answer is no then, like the, the shock curve is not just like the collection of points that are, are the characteristic curves crossing each other? Uh, no, okay. no, no, sure. no. there's, um, uh, here, there's a there's a picture in the notes. Maybe I'll I'll uh, I'll show, right? So um, so we had some time at which the shock formed in the in the previous example, uh, and oh, I can actually sort of draw how I think I, how I think it will will it look that particular case. Right, but this is just an example, something where it will tend to a zero speed as, uh, as time goes on, right? And what you've got is on all of these things, you've got these characteristics, right? Coming in, oh uh, yeah, 
Okay, if I'm gonna make this a picture of, then they were all at. Ah, they were all positive speeds, right? Okay, but, but, uh, okay, there you go. This is what I'm trying to do. Um, okay, let me, let me start again. <laughs> okay, here we go. So here's, here's my, uh, here's my shock formation, right? And we, we have some algebra to do that. Uh, now, maybe we can't do it analytically, but we can figure out uh, uh, how to uh, figure out the rest of this curve. Uh, and uh, in all of these things, okay, so I'm not going to try and do the, uh, the one uh, from the example. I'm just going to do, we've got characteristics that are coming in, right, not like this, right, uh, and uh, and um, I've got the U minus and the U plus uh, and the shock speed. This is the curve X is a function of T. So the shock speed that's DX by DT. Uh, and that'll be the uh, jump in F divided by the jump in U, right? U, U plus, U minus, right? You'll have this kind of picture. So, so that's why I was asking, like, the, the um, I might be missing something here, but, but X, X of T is, is the shock curve or, or no? Yes, it is. So, so these, these, uh, these lines here, these are the characteristic curves. And, and so would it be correct to say that the shock curve is formed by like the collection of points where your characteristics are crossing each other? Cause like, that, that's what your picture that's what I'm uh, getting from the teacher. Yeah, um, I, I guess I just want to say I want to be a little bit more specific, okay. right? That this property is what determines that, right? If I thought of these black lines right here as being the characteristics, uh, I could draw a different curve where they also crossed, where they also met, but it wouldn't satisfy this red relationship. Okay, right. I see. So, 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 so like, so you know, when they're crossing, you have to do something. Uh -huh. But there's all kinds of different things you could do, right? And I'll, I'll show you some examples, right? Uh, some extreme examples, right, where, where you really see what's going on. Uh, and the thing that tells you what you actually have to do is, is this relationship. Okay, so, so there's multiple possible kind of sets of curves that represent where all of the characteristics yeah. intersect. Yeah. And is all point. of them except this one, right? Uh -huh. Represent, um, yeah, mass being teleported in or out of, of your system. And so they're not physically uh, uh, correct. Okay, thank you. Think of this as a selection principle, right? You know, you, you have a family of weak solutions, right? Uh, but this is this is a, the condition that tells you which one you have to pick out. And once you do this, uh, then solutions are unique even when discontinuity is formed. Okay, that's some that's some theory that's that's past math four hundred. That's graduate level level stuff, but but it's true. So to summarize that, it's just the condition that tells you which uh, which shock curve to pick effectively. Because if you said there's very yeah, that's right. So I, I could imagine starting here from this uh, from this shock point and drawing different curves, like where the characteristics were all coming in, but they wouldn't satisfy this. So so you it's a, it's a something that you need to select the right solution. Okay. Okay. Um, there's one other thing that we need. Like this seems good, right? Uh, but in fact, just having this condition can lead you astray uh, and put in discontinuous solutions when you shouldn't. Um, but if you look at this picture, right, um, it, it really does look like you have a shock and 
the um, solution characteristics are coming into the shock on the left, on the, on the left, and they're also coming into the uh, shock wave on the right. Uh, and so uh, that gets, um, uh, this is the uh, left side characteristic speed. Uh, and then I've got the right side characteristic speed. Uh, and you really should have this relationship. Uh, and this is known as the lax entropy condition. Okay, and uh, there's a concrete example of why you need this uh, extra uh, condition uh, coming up. All right, okay. And for Berger's equation, remember F prime of U is just U. I need a U minus bigger than one half, a U plus plus U minus bigger than U plus. All right. All right, that was the S for Berger's equation. Okay, um, we know that shock forms, that shocks form, right? So we're gonna have discontinuous solutions. Our, uh, a very interesting idea to understand uh, how these different things behave. Uh, and it's also the basis of uh, a class of numerical methods. Oh, the lax entropy condition is, sorry, there's a question that came on Slack. Is the lax entropy condition always true? or is it specific to this case? Um, the lax entropy condition is, uh, is uh, another condition that has to be satisfied to introduce a shock. Um, oh, and it's not specific to this Gaussian start case. So uh, now I'm gonna talk about some different initial conditions uh, where uh, things really get highlighted, okay? So um, we're gonna talk about a Riemann problem. And like I say, Riemann problems uh, uh, really highlight uh, the dynamics in these kind of shock problems. Um, oh yes, so this has to uh, happen for a shock to occur. And you can sort of see this in your, in your head, right? We have to have the characteristics coming together, which would mean that the speed on the left has to be bigger than the speed on the, on the right, okay? Uh, so, um, okay, anyway, these Riemann problems are um, uh, useful for uh, numerical methods and also understanding the, the shock dynamics. So a Riemann problem uh, is a Cauchy problem. Uh, for a hyperbolic conservation law, Uh, with initial data that's discontinuous at x equals zero. Uh, you've got a left value and a right value and they're constant, right? So this is basically zooming in on, the, on, a, uh, on a shock Remember we said there's a shock where there's a discontinuity and everything on either side is, is smooth. Well, this is as smooth as you get. You just have constants on either side. Okay, so uh, let's, we can solve these problems. Let's uh, solve the uh, Riemann problem for uh, Berger's equation with 
u l equals one and the u r equals zero. Right, okay, and so I've got uh, my uh, speed. Oh, uh, an excellent question. Uh, in what sense uh, does the solution with the shock satisfy the original PDE if we're not looking at the discontinuity? Oh, yeah, it's, it's when I talk about smooth solutions, right? There's solutions with enough derivatives so that, uh, so that this equation is like actually satisfied in the way you can take the time derivative and take the space derivative and add them up and get zero. Um, and okay, so not to distract from the Riemann problem, which is really interesting, but that's what we used way back here. All of this work assumed that the actual PDE was satisfied as long as we weren't looking at the, at the, at, at, at the discontinuity. So we separated out the discontinuity from the smooth stuff that was on either side where the PDE is actually satisfied with like derivatives adding up. Obviously at a discontinuity, right? This PDE is not satisfied, but now we found uh, the right way to define a, a weak solution. Um, and it involved interpreting this thing as, as, a, as a conservation law, right? Oh, can I expand on that for a bit? I guess it's just what's confusing me is that it sort of seems from the original PDE that one condition says that f of x t has to be equal to a, and the other condition says that f of x t has to be equal to b. So after the shock forms, is either choice correct, or do you have to somehow satisfy both, which is impossible? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm 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 not. Uh, I'm, can you can you repeat that? Sure. Like when the two characteristics cross. Yeah. Oh, I don't they... yeah. you're saying, hey, the solution has to be this value and it also has to be this value. Yeah, but if we both? continue to follow one of those characteristics past where they intersect. Uh, well, okay. Isn't it going to cross another characteristic at which point there's a contradiction? So one of the things you could do, right, if you had no, no physics to go with these equations is just say solutions will be multiple, multiple have multiple values, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, but that's that's not where these equations come from and that's not why they're interesting, right? They're, they're actually, you know, describing shock waves and gas dynamics and, you know, they're useful for, uh, you know, aeronautical engineering and so on. And so uh, you, you, there is a solution and you have to figure out what, what it is and in this idealized setting, um, you have this, this discontinuity on either side, everything is behaving like you think it should, right? Uh, and the trouble is, uh, like you said, there'll be uh, contradictory information, right? Unless you introduce something new and, and this is the new thing you have to introduce. But then when we in introduce something new, like are we, are, and before we introduce something new, are we over constrained or under constrained? Uh, before you introduce it, you are um, under constrained. You have multiple values of the solution, right? Okay, but like it either would work. So like if you ignored the physics, you could choose either. Oh, and yeah. And then yeah. the physics sort yeah. of tells you which one to choose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, even in the case, this goes back to another question a student asked, even in the case where you know that you have multiple values in like in this picture, right? Um, without the physics in this, in this red box here on the side, th there's many different curves you could put and say, hey, the solution on this side, I'm gonna define from the characteristics on the right and on this side i'll satisfy with the characteristics on the left it's only by introducing this thing that you can really uh nail down what the solution has to be okay okay <clears throat> so let's look at this one i've got Berger's equation 
Uh, and I think this is related to the, um, the question, right? I've got u equals one here, uh, and I've got u equals zero here. <clears throat> oh, uh, to confirm after the shock that PDE itself still holds, uh, but that you get some new initial conditions almost from the shock. Well, yes and no. The PDE still holds everywhere except on the shock, right? Because it's discontinuous. You can't talk about, you know, the time derivative and the space derivatives across uh, at a discontinuity. Um, and so uh, really uh, the PDE on the shock is being uh, replaced by a more fundamental algebraic relation about the, um, uh, about the conservation. Does that, does that help? Okay, so let's just look at this problem, okay? So here, uh, I've got uh, the U left, and remember the value of U is the characteristic speed for Berger's equation with one half U squared is the F when I take uh, the, um, the, derivative to get the uh, shock speed, that's just u or the characteristic speed. So here I've got ul is bigger than ur and so a shock will form. And you can see it just from this picture. I know that uh, on all of these characteristics with slope one, u will have value one. And all of these characteristics with uh, uh, slope zero, right? Okay, inverse slope, vertical lines, uh, u will be zero. So I can see right away they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna cross, right? So I know I've got to have a, um, uh, a shock wave. Uh, and I know I've worked out that the shock speed expression in this case is just one half uh, ul plus ur. And so that's one half. And so the solution I'm gonna get to this Riemann problem is, okay, well, I've got all of these things here. I got all of these things here. I'm gonna have U identically equal to zero on uh, the right of the shock. So that's where the PDE is satisfied. I'm gonna have U identically equal to one on the left-hand side of the shock. And the shock is the line X is uh, T over two, right? So zero, I can see uh, my, uh, my uh, characteristics are entering on both sides. So my entropy condition is satisfied. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the picture. Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, how about we reverse things? Let's look at the same problem, but with uh, uh, the right speed zero and the left speed is one. So here UR is less than UL. So uh, a shock should not form. All right, so I've got UR is equal to zero. So I've got all of these characteristics here vertical lines, I've got you, uh, oh, that's left. I always have trouble with right and left, okay. Uh, that is left, 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 and right. Um, okay, uh, this is one <laughs> and this is zero. Okay, sorry, right and left. So hard to uh, remember which is which as you're trying to lecture. So my right is now one and my left is zero. And so you are is you are is right and left. 
Okay, so this is bigger than you, L. Right, okay, good. Now I've got this, uh, these characteristics like this. Okay, apologies with the, uh, the right and left uh, confusion, okay? So now the question is, what's in here? Okay, so here is where you need the uh, lax uh, uh, entropy conditions, right? Because there is a shock you could put in there, which would satisfy uh, the conservation property, uh, moving at speed one half, right? But then you would have information coming out of the shock instead of going uh, in. Uh, and there's really no reason to put a, a shock in there. So uh, uh, don't put a shock uh, in the question mark, uh, the lax entropy condition. will not be, be satisfied. Okay, so what do you do? You go, well, let's imagine that my initial data was a little bit different, okay? We've done this before, right? I know it's got to be a one out here and I know it's gotta be zero out here. But let me just put in, this is U0, uh, U0 as a function of S. Let's just um, smooth out this a little bit. Now, if I did this before in the previous example, if I smoothed out uh, the initial conditions that made a shock, I would have the shock form almost immediately and have the same behavior as I had before. Uh, but if I do it uh, here, uh, then if I go back to my, um, my question mark, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have uh, all of these speed one things here. I'll have all of my speed zero things over here. And now I'll, I'll see, I'm gonna fill out uh, the region in the question mark will be filled out uh, with uh, all of these different uh, um, waves. And this, this thing here is called a rarefaction wave. This is all uh, 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 terminology that comes from, um, um, uh, gas dynamics. Okay, so let's just think about this, right? Uh, on the rarefaction wave, um, I should be satisfying the PDE because it looks smooth. There's no discontinuities there, right? So uh, remember the characteristic speed Uh, is uh, F prime of U, that's U for Berger's equation. Uh, and so um, on these lines that are really coming from the origin, right? I should have U of X over T uh, being uh, X over T, right? Or in general, uh, F prime of uh, U will be equal to uh, U uh, on uh, the rarefaction rates. Uh, okay, no, no. No, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's not true. Let's continue on with this Burgers equation case. So I'm gonna have 
uh, u of x and t in this case is gonna be, uh, well, uh, zero if x is less than zero. Uh, it's gonna be one if x is bigger than t. And it'll be, Uh, x divided by t on this wedge uh, in here. Okay, now let me think a little bit about the uh, general rarefaction wave. Uh, it's, no, I have to think. Uh, okay, let me come back to that. Okay, what do we got? I got about 15 minutes left. So, um, let's look at a, a, a new uh, conservation law. So not Berger's equation, it's gonna be a traffic flow model. <clears throat> How have we shown that the PDE is satisfied within the rarefaction wave? Uh, well, uh, if you, um, Uh, if you uh, look at this solution, uh, you can take uh, ut, right? Uh, and that is, uh, now I have to think here for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna have u of, uh, x divided by t is x divided by t. Uh, that's a good question. I'm gonna come back to that uh, next lecture. Um, my rarefaction uh, wave um, uh, brain is not, uh, is not working out quite well. Let, let me come back to the general case for rarefaction waves uh, at the beginning of next lecture. We'll press on with the uh, traffic flow model. So um, I'm gonna have a traffic flow. It's gonna be a single lane, one direction. Uh, no, uh, no stoplights. It's a long stretch of highway, single lane. Okay, so you can put in all kinds of uh, stuff um, uh, uh, to make these models more complicated, but uh, this is this is going to fit in the framework of stuff that we know. Okay, so I'm going to have uh, let uh, rho of x and t uh, be the density of cars on this long stretch of highway. It's going to be a um, uh, a Cauchy problem, so it's going to be an infinite highway. Uh, yes, I will come back to the uh, rarefaction wave uh, uh, next uh, next lecture when I've had a chance to to remember how 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 it goes uh, in a good enough way that I can actually uh, explain it uh, uh, well, as opposed to muddling around like I was doing before. Okay. Um, and they're going to be going with a velocity uh, v. Okay, so um, uh, this is uh, this is the model. Uh, now you notice that it's not a individual car based model. It's uh, there's been some continuum uh, averaging. Uh, where I'm just talking about density and uh, average velocity of cars rather than like here is an actual you know, car uh, moving with velocity uh, and comparing it to its neighbor. That's also done in, in traffic uh, flow model. Okay, and um, 
I'm going to put some limits on what the solution uh, should look like. I'm going to have a maximum density, right? This is bumper to bumper. Uh, and I'm going to have a speed limit. Uh, which uh, unlike uh, real traffic, everyone will obey. Okay, and um, in, in this setting, right, I've got rho times V. That's the flux of cars. Uh, and so I can write a conservation law, right? If I'm going to uh, have these things not um, create or destroy cars, I got this right away, right? Okay, so uh, that's pretty good. Uh, of course, I've got rho and I've got V and I've only got one equation. So uh, now you have to uh, do some informed uh, thoughts about how traffic might behave. So uh, I'm gonna make uh, an assumption Uh, that uh, I can work out the speed of the cars on this one dimensional one lane highway with no passing uh, that depends on the density. Okay. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have a model that gives me uh, the speed uh, in terms of the density. Uh, and as an example, I'm going to take the uh, speed to be the maximum if the density is zero, right? So there's very few cards on the row. Everyone's going at the maximum speed uh, down to a zero speed when uh, the density is at its maximum. Okay, so this is a pretty uh, simple assumption, but but you know it's got. Um, it's got the sort of characteristics of, you know, you're gonna, with very few cards on the road, you're gonna be going the maximum speed and there will be a density at which no one is moving at all. And I'm just doing a linear fit uh, to, to those two values. All right, so now I've got uh, just a problem for a uh, row. Uh, which is rho v max one minus rho over rho max. Okay, and um, I like u better than rho, uh, and I like scaled problems better than problems with uh, variables in them. So I'll say you can uh, scale and non-dimensionalize and you can get a problem that looks like ut uh, plus f of u uh, x is zero where my u is the scale density uh, and so this is going to be uh, u times one minus u, okay? We've done some of this kind of thing before, non-dimensionalizing, you could probably imagine how to, how to, how to do that, okay? So um, there we go. Um, okay, so this is u minus u squared. Okay, so well, let's uh, let's look at the uh, rankine hugonio conditions for this problem, All right? So rankine hugonio <clears throat> if I have a shock wave, it's got to satisfy the jump in F divided by the jump in U. That's U plus minus U plus squared minus U minus plus u minus squared divided by u 
plus minus u minus. That looks like it's one minus u plus plus u minus after some algebra, which hopefully I've done correctly. Uh, and I can also look at the lax entropy conditions that say uh, the speed on the right, uh, on the left has to be faster than the shock speed and the speed on the right has to be slower than the shock speed. I've got uh, my um, characteristic speeds are one minus two u. Okay, and that tells me that one minus two u minus has to be greater than one minus u plus plus u minus has to be greater than one minus two u plus. Uh, and now I'm going to um, switch the signs. Okay, because the one I can take out and then I have to switch the signs, but that means I have to change the direction of the inequalities. So the density <clears throat> uh, behind has to be lower than the average density, which has to be less than the density uh, up uh, in front. Okay, and this makes sense. Right. This says you can only have shocks forming when there is a greater density of cars in front of you than uh, in behind. Right. So uh, this makes sense. Uh, traffic flow uh, makes a shock. only when the density ahead is less than the density behind. Okay, and I've got one minute left. I'll probably take more than one uh, minute. Let me do a shock. Uh, and then next time I'll come back and do a rarefaction and I'll also remember how to present uh, the rarefaction uh, wave uh, correctly. Okay, so let's, let's look at uh, the case where I'm gonna have a shock. I've got lighter density behind, so I'm, uh, the cars are moving faster. I've got a heavier density ahead, so the cars are moving slower, so a shock will form. When I write out these capital letters, I hope it's clear I'm talking about a Riemann problem. So I'm gonna have the shock speed is one minus one half plus one third. Ooh, that's minus one sixth. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, and here's what it looks like. I've got my X, I've got my T. Right, I've got my uh, characteristic speeds. Right, uh, that is, remember F prime of U is one minus two U. So F prime at UL is zero. Uh, F prime at UR is minus one third. I've got this shock wave. This is the uh, X is minus T over six. That's the shock. I've got my uh, density U equals one half moving with characteristic speed zero. So I got these kind of things. Here's my uh, lower density, right? Um, and 
uh, I've got the uh, minus one third. I've got these guys going like this. These are the U is two thirds, right? <clears throat> Uh, two thirds. It's the uh, UL plus UR. Yeah, yeah, typo. Typo in my notes as well. Um, so here is the uh, here's the sort of situation now, which makes sense. Um, and this is something that highlights the difference between sort of characteristic speeds and actual speeds. Uh, in this scenario, all of the cars are moving forwards, right? Right, they're all moving this way. Um, uh, but the information, right, is traveling in uh, along these characteristics, right? That's different. And you notice that this shock wave is moving backwards. Uh, and what does that mean? It means just like what happens in a sort of a traffic, you know, sort of jam, right? Uh, <clears throat> it starts somewhere up ahead and propagates uh, backwards in the flow of traffic. That's what this is. This is showing. Okay, so like I say, um, I will um, come back to this. I'll do the Riemann problem uh, where uh, there's a rarefaction wave, and I'll get the rarefaction wave discussion uh, right. Uh, we'll do that next time. Uh, we're also going to have just a very brief discussion on true nonlinear first order equations. Uh, we'll look at the iconal equation and some, some variants. Uh, that'll be at the end of the discussion of, of, um, of these scalar first order equations. And we'll go on to the wave equation, which, which we can um, get as a vector version of these kind of problems. Okay, I'm going to stop recording.